alone has the power to redeem. Thank you, Christy and the Henry boys. Reminding us of that. A couple years ago, as I was talking to the Lord, one of those moments when, you know, you're just kind of praying and may I be honest with you, not expecting a lot, just talking to the Lord. And he reminded me in that prayer time of how he calls us to kingdom work. Now, I've been centered on the, the local church all my life. As I've made mention before, I was in the local church six months or nine months before I was born. Been in the church all my life. My father was not a pastor, but we were one of those families that opened the doors, closed the doors, were there usually before the preacher, and thereafter he left. Just what we did. Got away from it for a while in my teenage years, but God called me back in ministry to the local church. And so my focus daily, in and out, is the local church. Who we are, what we do, how we relate to one another, how we do it right, how we do it wrong, how we need to forgive and love. And, and in that, God reminds me from time to time that there's more than the four walls of the local church. That it's about the kingdom. And so, in that prayer time, it was at this time of the year that God reminded me about an event that we do that sometimes has been polarizing in our church. But he put the thought in my heart that it's a kingdom event. That you share the gospel and leave the results to God. There's people throughout this area and actually throughout the country who have heard the gospel in this event, have gone on later or in that moment to accept Christ and serve in other places. It's a kingdom event. And so truth or terror is a kingdom event. If I don't fall off the stage, I better back up a little bit. So I want to take a moment to have a special prayer for this kingdom event. If you are involved in truth or terror this year, in any capacity, if you're making cookies, if you're running sound, if you're, if you're working in any capacity at all in truth or terror, I want you to stand. I want to challenge us as a church and those who are serving to pray this week for this kingdom event. For there will be people here who will be the first time that they're exposed to the gospel message of saving in Jesus Christ. Many will come and they've heard the message, but it'll click this time. So let's dedicate this to him. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that we have a gospel message that goes across generations and across media and reaches the hearts of people. I thank you for the ministry that we have, a kingdom work through truth or terror. And I thank you for these, dedicating their time and their talents, their efforts, and who they are and what they have. Bless them, Lord. But may they keep their focus throughout this week, and especially on Friday and Saturday, their focus on Jesus. Bless us, Father. And we dedicate this time and this effort to you in his name. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 Thank you, folks. Be seated. I expect that many of you this morning are wide awake because I saw a lot of you eating candy last night. You were supposed to be giving away. So hopefully you're still wired. But this morning we're going to continue the series that we've been sharing together. Hopefully we're going to do that. Hopefully we're going to do that. And Jesus said, what? We started this series with the, with the premise of this. There are a lot of things in the Bible that, that Jesus challenges us to. A lot of words that are hard, that are difficult, and, and it's good to look at those, and we will in days ahead. But oftentimes, it's the things that we've heard over and over again, the, the words that we hear, that we think we know, 
that we sometimes miss. And so we've been looking at the words of Jesus. We looked at Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And what that meant to be a disciple of Jesus by taking up the cross. Last week, we looked at Luke chapter 6, verse 31. Just as you want men to do to you, you also do them do to them likewise, which is the? Six of you know it's the golden rule. All right. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So this week, we're going to continue that series of Jesus said what? We're going to look at two of the most known, most well-known, most quoted sayings of Jesus from John chapter 3. So, since you have your Bible in any form that you want to bring your Bible, would you open your Bible to John chapter 3? In John's Gospel, up to this point, Jesus has been introduced in chapter 1 with those great words, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And later on, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. And so we, we get an introduction from the very beginning of time of who Jesus is. You move through chapter 1, and you'll see that He is baptized in chapter 1. goes to John, and John doesn't feel worthy, but Jesus says this is the Father's will, and, and even as He's baptized, the Father confirms His baptism. Some of the disciples are called in John chapter 1, uh, John chapter one and, and we see that there. And then as we move to chapter 2 in John, we see that he is, uh, is performing his first miracle, the wedding at Cana, where he turns the water into wine. And, and as, he, as he does that, people are watching. They're seeing his ministry as it's starting. And so we continue in John chapter 2. He comes to Jerusalem and he looks around and sees things in the temple aren't right. There's a lot of commerce going on. And so he cleanses the temple and he gets a lot of attention because of that. Then at the end of that time, we come to, a, to the passage that we're going to look at this morning. He's in Jerusalem during the Passover and the many feasts. Many uh, believed in his name. They saw the signs which he did, but he didn't commit himself, it says in verse 24, because he knew all men. And had no need that anyone should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And then we open up chapter 3. Now chapter 3 is one of those well-known chapters in the Bible. Because it begins with an introduction. Verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And in that verse, we learn a lot about this guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was a Jew. We learn from this writing and others, that he was a Pharisee who was the most conservative and the largest group of religious leadership and religious followers in Judaism at that time. He was a priest. He had to be a priest to be a ruler of the Jew. He was married. That was a requirement. If you're going to suffer for your faith, you might as well su No, I didn't go there. I, I, I didn't go there, did I? I'm, I'm sorry. But there were regulations. If you're going to be a priest, you had to be married. He, uh, he was also a, a ruler, it says here, a ruler of the Jews, which meant that he was a member of the 70-member Sanhedrin, which was the ruling council of Jews at the time. And they, they did everything, all the laws that they followed were, were run by, and the final say was by the Sanhedrin. He practiced his faith in the open. The Pharisees were very, very open. You know, at one point, uh, Jesus points to them and says, you know, they, they tithe and they do this and they do that and they're just so, so pious. Well, that was their faith. They practiced what they believed. They practiced their rituals in public. The Pharisees, these rulers of the Jews, were looking for the Messiah. They were looking for one who would come and who would, who would deliver them from all of their oppression. And also, they believed in the resurrection. Now, the other group, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection, but the Pharisees did. And so this was the man standing before Jesus. It says in here in verse 2, this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Notice he says he came to him at night. Now we don't know why he came at night. Probably was good reason. Jesus was very busy, had a lot of people around him. It's hard to get a good discourse, a personal one-on-one. -on -one. 
except in the evening, so he came to him at night. Others say he came to him on cloak of darkness so that other people wouldn't see him coming to Jesus. Perhaps he was even sent by the Sanhedrin to kind of do a little fact-checking with Jesus and see who this man really was early in his ministry. Maybe he was on orders. He says in verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. And the word know there is not head knowledge. In other words, if you could translate that, we have watched you do your thing. And so we can see from what you're doing, your miracles and, and, and your working with people, we see that you are from God. No one can do these signs unless he is from God. So, so these signs and wonders, Nicodemus is, is confirming that we've seen this. And so we have a question about who you are. Notice in this, he says, we have done this. We know this. Giving the idea that he's probably there on authority of the larger group of religious leaders. Then we come to our famous verse, verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. I want you to notice something here. Nicodemus is talking in the we. We are checking you out. We know that you're doing signs and wonders. We know that you're a great person come from God. Jesus just cuts it right to the heart. He stops. He says, unless you are born again. He comes from the impersonal to the personal. And, and hits Nicodemus right in his head as well as his heart. I like how Jesus does this here. My Bible says most assuredly. If you have the King James versions, it says what? Verily, verily. Translated into modern English, it's truth, truth. He's emphasizing this point. Here is truth. He says it twice. Truth, truth. Most assuredly. Verily, verily. Truth, truth. Listen, Nicodemus, because what you're going to hear is truth. And he says, unless one is born again, anew, made fresh, anew, not old, but made new again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now remember, Nicodemus was a Pharisee and he was looking for the kingdom, looking for the Messiah, looking for the one who would come to usher in a golden age with God's people. And Jesus says, unless you're born again, unless your life completely changes, and you are renewed in your person, personally, you'll never see the kingdom of God. That had to rock Nicodemus back a little bit. Because his Nicodemus, his, his, his reaction to that, in verse 4, he says, but, but how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Um, I mean, he's... He's come there with his head. He's come there with all of his background. He's come there with all that he knows. And he's expecting to have a, a lengthy, intellectual, biblical discussion with Jesus, this great teacher. And Jesus just smacks him right between the eyes. Unless you are born again, you will not see what you've lived your whole life trying to see. And that's the kingdom of God. But it confuses Nicodemus. He says, well, well, well wait a minute. I've had biology class. You, you can only be born one time. And you can't enter back into your mother's womb. This is, this is crazy talk. He's trying to wrap his head around what Jesus is saying. So Jesus explains it. Look with me in verses 5 and 6. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And, and many scholars have, have wrestled with these verses. What's it mean by the water and the Spirit? And, and some say, well, it that's, that's shows baptism. It shows what Jesus did. And, and quite simply, very physically, it means that you are born originally in water. But you have to be born again in the Spirit. It's not hard to understand if you let your mind open to what God will do. And that's what Jesus says to Nicodemus. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear a sound of it. You cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And then Nicodemus says, Whoa, 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 time out. Time out. How can these things be? Now, grasp the, the impact of this. 
I'll say it again. I'm going to say it four or five times before I'm done here this morning. Nicodemus was a man who had it all together. He was a religious leader. He was trained. He was a priest. He had everything together. He had all the answers. He followed all the rules. He did everything he was supposed to do. And he can't grasp it here. Jesus has basically blown him out of the water here. How can these things be? How can they be? A man of the world knew the things of God, knew about God, thought he had all the right answers, lived his faith in public. He did all he thought and was told was important to be a godly man. But when he was face to face with Jesus, it was a completely different story. You know, when we really understand something, we often say that it is crystal clear. When we finally get it, hey, that's clear, I, I get it, it's crystal clear. I just want to illustrate it this way. This doesn't really have anything to do with the sermon, but I just like this picture. Wouldn't you like to be there? Keith would. I thought for sure I'd get Brendan Bill to say yes. Okay, all right. This ear didn't hear you. It just, that's crystal clear. It looks like that boat is hovering in the air, but it's just setting in crystal clear water. When, when we get something, it's crystal clear. I like that image. But when there is not clarity, we often end up like this. Whoa. Focus. Focus. The next question, Nicodemus' question in verse 7 shows that he needs clarity and that his focus has been cut off. How can these things be? I don't get it. And so Jesus begins to talk with him, and then he cuts to the heart of the matter as we come to the second most famous verse in this passage. And that's John 3, 16. You know it by heart, don't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He cuts to the heart of it here. He said that God so loved. Now, now, now grasp that word love. While the Jewish religion was based on the love of God for his people, it had become not a relationship of love, but a relationship of duty and tradition. Nicodemus was a good Jew because he followed the rules. He followed the tradition. But from what we know and what we experience in the gospel, there was very little love of God shared. That's why Jesus was so refreshing. For God so loved. Relationship is about love. Here, he says, God so loved that he gave. He gave. God so loved the world that he gave. Now, the world is a concept that is important too. Because the Jews were told back in the Old Testament that they were to be a blessing to the nations. But they had become so exclusionary, even if you came to Jerusalem to worship, if you were a Gentile, you stayed so far out. If you were a woman, you could go a little bit further, but you had to stay far out. If you were a man, a good Jew, and did your sacrifices, you could come a little bit further in, in the court of the Jews, and that was good. If you were a priest, you could come a little bit further. But only one guy could get in the Holy of Holies once a year. You see the exclusion? That's what it had become. Follow the rules. And if you follow the rules right, we might let you close, but not close enough. And so here Jesus says, For God so loved the world, everyone, that he gave his only begotten son. I, I, I love that phrase. Your, your Bible may say something else if you have a different translation. Some of them say his only unique son. And that word begotten in this context means unique there's never been one before like him there will never be one after him like this he is god's own unique son for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever once again everyone would come everyone might come it not just because not if you just do the good tradition practicing jew but whoever jesus gives no qualifying here other than Whoever believes in him, that's the, that's the catch. There must be belief in him. 
will not perish, will not be separated from eternity, but have everlasting life. This is clear. This is straightforward. This is why this is so popular. This isn't hard to understand. God sent His Son. If we believe in Him, we have everlasting life. It's clear. It's straightforward. He goes on to explain it a little further. Look at verse 17. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He said all should come, that none should perish. For God sent His Son not to condemn, but to save the world. Standing before Nicodemus was the one who would save. And then he says, then in verse 19, or 18, He who believes in Him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And he goes on, follow with me, verses 19 through 21. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light because of their evil deeds. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen that they had been done in God. Now, Nicodemus is there when? At night. Thank you, Jack. He's there at night. So there's a, a, a light and darkness play going on in this discourse with Nicodemus that Jesus captures and says here, the deeds that you do, you do in the light because Jesus has come to bring you to the light. Over in the first chapter, we're reminded that Jesus came as the light of the world. And so over and over again in John, we see this theme going on, that he has come to save, and he has not come to condemn. So here we are. At the end of this, it abruptly ends. Nicodemus just kind of fades out of the picture. There's nothing else said about him in chapter 3. Jesus goes on, and, and, and there's a discourse about him and John the Baptist. What happens to Nicodemus? Well, the rest of the story is that Nicodemus shows up in John chapter 7, verse 50, as the Jewish leaders were trying to find a way to arrest Jesus. Nicodemus stands up and says, Hey, why are we condemning someone and never gave him a chance to speak? Of course, then they say, All right, Nicodemus, you must be one of his. And then he shows up after that, when Jesus is crucified, and he's dead on the cross, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus take his body and place it in the tomb. So that's what we know of Nicodemus. History calls him a secret disciple. I don't know why that word is. We, there's no evidence in the Bible of him being a disciple other than him honoring Jesus in this way. But here we have Nicodemus. And so, Jesus said what? Well, all of this stuff, most of us, if not all of us, know. But, how real is this to you today? How real is it to you? This is a very personal encounter with Jesus by Nicodemus. It is the longest encounter that Jesus has in the Gospels with one individual. Nicodemus. It's very personal. In this scene, Jesus is very, very upfront with Nicodemus. Moving from we to you. His, his words are very personal over and over again. Jesus gets in Nicodemus' faith face, into his head, and ultimately into his heart. Remember, and let me put it in, in, in a context that you and I will grasp. Remember, Jesus is talking to a church person here. He's not talking to a lost, outside-the-church sinner. He is talking to a church leader. He is talking to someone who has lived his faith all of his life and has been rewarded with the honors of being on the Sanhedrin. He is a man of faith, if you will, a church person. That's who Jesus is talking to. You've come here today for a variety of reasons to worship. That's good. You've come here today because, well, this is where I come. It's my church. I always do. You come here today because, well, it's Sunday, and Sunday I go to church. You come here today because you have to. You come here today seeking some word from the Lord. You come here today with a variety of reasons. Have you come here today for an encounter with Jesus Christ personally? That's what Nicodemus did. And he got more than he bargained for. And I ask you, if you've come for an encounter with Jesus, will you allow Him to speak to your head 
and more importantly, to your heart through Nicodemus today? What are you focused on? What makes you a good person or a godly person or not? Look, we can focus on good things, on important things, and still be out of the kingdom. Jesus calls us to a personal relationship with God through Him. So I ask you today, the very question that Jesus put to Nicodemus, are you born again? Are you born again? Have you had an encounter with Jesus Christ that has changed not only your thought process, but your heart, your life? Have you gone beyond what you know, what you don't know, your goodness, your sinfulness, and come to new life in Him? Today, He says, come. He says, you are a sinner, but I will save you. For all of you, all of us, have sinned. But God demonstrated when He put Jesus on the cross, His love for us, because He died for us. Whoever believes in Him has that personal encounter with Jesus can come. Have you done that? Has there been a time in your life when you can say, yes, I took Jesus seriously and He took me seriously and, 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 and I've asked Him to forgive me and save me? Have you done that? Today He says, come. Come. What, what better way to start a worship than, than to see what Jesus has done in the life of a young person? and saving them and bringing them to grace. Do you know Jesus? Are you born again? If I were to walk up to you in the foyer after church and look you straight in the eye and say, are you born again? Would you say, well, I'm not too sure. Then you're not. Will you come to him today? Come. Church folks, you and I, the Nicodemuses here this morning, are you truly born again I'm not talking about something you did once and it was done I'm not talking about coming to church I'm not even talking about something you did in the past when you were baptized what I'm saying is have you had a life-changing life-altering eternal life-giving encounter with Jesus and been born again you may think you've got it all figured out or maybe it's too late or well, preacher, you don't know what so-and-so did to me. Are you born again? Is there that moment in your life, church folks, that you look back to and say, yes. Yes, I had an encounter with Jesus and it changed my life forever. Can you say that this morning? And if not, now is the time to say. Now's the time to swallow our pride and, and, our, and, and get in humility and, and get it right. Get it right today. Now, I don't like to use this illustration, but I'm going to do it anyway because it came to my heart. We don't know, and I'm not using this as a fear factor for you, but we don't know from one day to the next if we have another day. Walked in this morning. It's about 10 minutes to 7, or 10 minutes to 8. Walked into the foyer and looked at the chair sitting beside the Welcome Center. My buddy Gary Andrews used to sit in that chair. He beat me to church on Sunday morning. He beat every, all of us to church. on. He was here around 7, 7, 15 every Sunday morning. Now, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, Gary didn't know that he'd be in heaven this morning. I praise God that he is. I thank the Lord that he is healed by friend. But let me ask the question. Are you born again, church person? Are you trusting in something like Nicodemus that you know, that you've always done, always a tradition? Are you bent out of shape about something that's not outside your control or inside your control? It's not about any of that. Come today and settle it with Jesus. Remember, Jesus is talking to church people here. Good man. A pillar of faith in his community. And he was as lost as the sinner in the gutter. Are you born again? When I was a young man, younger man, living at home, moved out of the 
childhood years into the teenage years and I started to care about the way I looked and what my clothes looked like and all of that and and uh, and so every now and then I'd I'd ask my mother is is this shirt dirty and you know what she'd say to me Steve if it's doubtful it's dirty now follow me here if I ask you this morning are you born again and there's a doubt in your mind, and you better settle it before you leave here. Because we don't know the next breath and place we have. And I'm not just talking to us who haven't made that decision for Jesus. I'm talking to us who are people, who are members of churches, who go to church all the time, who think we've got it settled and got it faith. Have you had a life-changing, life-altering, eternal, life-giving encounter with Jesus Christ? If so, then just thank Him today. Celebrate that. Give him honor and glory that he's due. And if not, if there's a doubt, then today, get on your knees here and talk to Jesus. Come and we'll pray together. Stay, stand where you are or come and sit in the front pew and just work it out with Jesus before you leave this place. Because he looked at Nicodemus as he looks at your heart this morning and says, you must be born again. Father, thank you for the word. Lord, it, we know these words. Most of us have heard them all of our life. You must be born again. And, and for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish but have eternal life. We know these words. But have those words by that man Jesus encountered our heart and changed our lives? Lord, that's the question for us in this hour. So, Lord, may your Holy Spirit work right now, right here, in this place. I pray in his name. Amen. Will you stand with me, please? During this time of invitation, we're going to simply ask, say the Savior is waiting. Won't you come? I'll be standing here if you'd like to, to pray with someone. Or you say, you know, I've, I've, I've followed Jesus. I've had that encounter, but I need to let the world know it's, it's in me. And I, and I want to do that through baptism. We've got... Baptism coming up in the month of November also, you can be a part of that. Or you may just want to come and thank him on your knees for all that he's done for you. Or come and say, Jesus, we need to work some things out. As we sing, you may come. The Savior is waiting to enter your home. Altar's open, there's plenty of room here for you to come. If you'll take one step toward the Savior, my friend, you'll find his arms open wide. Receive him and all of your darkness will end.
Father, it's an eternal question. It's one we have to answer. Well, the world may not think it's important, but how vital it is from your word that we be born again. Father, as we go, as a born-again people, we go to share that reality, that truth in our world today. Compel us to go in Jesus' name. Amen. Before you leave, I want to remind you that after our Sunday school hour, we'll be coming back in here for our memorial service, remembering Matsy Ewing. You're invited to come.